And so during Easter time, often we'll say, uh, one person will say, he is risen, and then the rest will say, he is risen indeed. So let's try that. He is risen. He is risen indeed. For certainly our risen Lord Jesus is the center of our faith and life. A few opportunities for discipleship and things to know about our church that's going on. Um, our Mother's Day Bulletin, Annual Tradition, um, you see there, you can sign up and, and um, have people mentioned in memory of them or in honor of them. And the due date for that is uh, May the 10th. Um, and that is a fundraiser for our United Methodist Youth. Um, we want to thank you on behalf of the mission committee uh, who made those amazing chicken pies. I really, I can, my mouth is watering right now thinking about them. Thank you, thank you. But the proceeds from that going to our local food pantries. And there are many, many persons uh, who are in need here in our county and city. Uh, just as a little placeholder, the Christian Help Center helps about 500 uh, uh, families each month. And um, the uh, uh, make sure this is on. Can you hear me from the mic? Okay. Um, you can't hear me. I'm not coming through. So there might be some technical trouble. How about that? Okay. On these. Sorry about that. Here we go. Is that better? We'll see if we can figure that out. Um, they, the Christian Help Center across the parking lot helps about five to 600 people per month. And uh, the uh, the food pantry of Roxborough and Person County over on Hill Street uh, serves about 250 people a week. So there's a lot of hungry people in our midst. So if you enjoyed one of those chicken pies, know that you're helping uh, those who are often hungry in our world. We continue to uh, invite you to a Sunday school class that happens at 10 o'clock in the church library in the very next room over here. And um, that is for newcomers, uh, for anyone really that wants to form uh, themselves in discipleship in community with others. We are about to start our annual Life Choices Pregnancy Support Center fundraiser, uh, giving away or giving you baby bottles to fill up with change. We can collect those, uh, and that starts on Mother's Day, which is just a couple of weeks away. And then, please, if you have a graduate, uh, whether from high school or college, and want that graduate to be recognized, there's some important information for you uh, in our bulletin there. And lastly, we are receiving a, um, a love offering for our uh, recently finished with us intern, Lucy Birch. We'll re be receiving that throughout the month of May. So if you'd like to make a contribution to that love offering, you're welcome to do so. Um, I think those are all the announcements that I had at this point. Um, and so we continue today with, with our worship.
I invite you to join together in our call to worship, which is printed in your bulletin. How awesome to gather before God. We are here to celebrate with wide-eyed wonder. Praise God for all the signs of new life. Praise God for all we can do together. Christ came to offer us abundant life. We are here today to reclaim that gift. This morning, uh, we will in just a moment be reading from our, uh, our affirmation after the hymn, the 23rd Psalm, which is uh, familiar to many of you. It starts out, the Lord is my shepherd. And so this prayer, this opening prayer today is inspired by that 23rd Psalm. Let us hear your voice today, O shepherd. Call our names and claim us as your own. Lead us beside still waters and restore our souls. Comfort those who suffer pain and loss. Assure all who are afraid. Lead us in right paths for your namesake. God, we have known your goodness and mercy in so many times and places, and we open ourselves now to receive these gifts again. Unlock within us the barriers that keep us from recognizing and appreciating all the evidence of your love that surrounds us. It's in Jesus' precious name that we pray, and all God's people said, amen. I invite you to stand as you are able, either in body or spirit, as we sing our opening hymn, number 559, in your hymnal, Christ is Made the Sure Foundation.
invite you to keep your hymnals open and turn them to page 137, which is uh, the best place within your pews to find the uh, Psalm 23 uh, in the King James Version, which many of us uh, know best. We'll read it today as our affirmation of faith, remembering Jesus, our good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. you're seated, won't you take a few moments and share the peace of Christ with one another. Jay, peace of Christ. Joining together uh, in preparation of our hearts to uh, hear the word of God read, the scripture read, I invite you to join together as we pray this prayer for illumination. It's printed in your bulletin. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Amen. Our scripture this morning is read from the second chapter of Acts. I know one of our Bible studies, the, one, uh, the Sunday school that meets downstairs, is working through Luke and Luke's gospel. Uh, the book of Acts is the second volume of the book of Luke, basically, telling the story of the early church. And so uh, with an eye towards where it all began for us, the church, we hear this uh, scripture that takes place right on the heels of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon the church beginning in verse 42 of Acts chapter 2. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Above the hill of time the cross. 
cross is gleaming Fair as the sun when night has turned to day And from it love's pure light is richly streaming To cleanse the heart and banish sin away To this dear cross Amen. Thank you, Bill. And uh, in just a moment, we're going to have the children come down, but I forgot to mention at the beginning of the service, this afternoon at four o'clock, we're having Paint and Praise, which is a new ministry for children. It's kind of a mini VBS uh, within the span of an hour, praise music, making a craft, painting. Maybe you've seen some of that on display in our halls over the last months uh, when uh, the kids get together and paint those things. So that's happening today at four that's in the Lewis room, right? Uh, which is downstairs. Autumn can help you find it. And then at five o'clock today, our youth are getting together from five to seven for their normal youth fellowship. So looking forward to see any of you uh, that are, are, are interested in that. See you there. Now, would the kids please come down uh, to hear a special, special message from Miss Autumn. While they're coming, parents following the children's message, we're going to dismiss the kids to children's church. You don't have to listen to my sermon. They uh, will be having children's church uh, off to themselves and learning about God and what it means to be the church together. It's been a long time since I've been up here. I hope I know what I'm doing. Um, so a long time ago, before you were born, before I was born, they used to have a TV show called Who Do You Trust? Does anybody remember the TV show? Okay, so we don't, but a couple people do, right? So today we're going to play our own version of Who Do You Trust, okay? First I'm going to tell you what type of question I'm going to ask, okay? For example, I might say, I'm going to ask you a question about the Bible. And then I will say to one of you, okay, Who Do You Trust? And then you're going to choose another person to answer the question correctly, okay? Are y'all ready? Does anybody want to volunteer to go first? Okay. All right. Are you ready? I'm going to ask a Bible question, okay? So who do you trust? Who are you going to choose? All right, you're choosing Margaret. Okay, here we go. All right, here's the question. What person in the Bible was swallowed by a great big fish? It was a whale. That helps. I, very good. See, you were right. That's right. Margaret knew 
And you knew you could trust her to answer the question correctly, okay? All right, we're going to try it again with a different type of question, okay? This time, let's choose Briggs. Who do you trust to answer this question? Bradsher? Okay. Good choice. Really good choice. All right, Bratcher, who is small with round ears, his friend is a duck, and he has a dog named Pluto? Good job. Y'all are smart. Good choice. You didn't know the answer? <laughs> Playing the game, who do you trust, can be a lot of fun, but in real life, it is very important to know who we can trust. I know where we can find the answer. We can find the answer to that question in the Bible in Psalm 23. It's one of the best love passages in the whole Bible. When we read it, it sounds as if someone may have just asked David the question, Who do you trust? What was his answer? His answer was, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. David was himself a shepherd, and he knew that sheep can trust the shepherd in every situation. When the sheep are hungry, the shepherd takes them to green pastures where they have plenty to eat. When the sheep are thirsty, he leads them to a quiet stream where they can drink. When the sheep are in danger of being eaten by wild animals, the shepherd is their protector. The sheep can trust the shepherd in every situation. Each day we find ourselves facing difficult situations and we have difficult choices to make. We often ask ourselves, who can I trust? The answer is, does anybody know the answer? What is it, Graceland? No, not everybody. Who can we trust? The Lord Jesus, that's right. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the good shepherd, and we are his sheep. Just like David, we can say, are you ready? Say it after me, okay? The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. We can trust him in every situation. All right, and now we're going to pray, okay? All right, everybody close your eyes, okay? Dear Jesus, you are the good shepherd, and we are your sheep. We put our trust in you. Amen. All right, and we're going to line up for Children's Church right over there. Children's Church, we're going to sing a, a little different song. It comes from South Africa. We are marching in the light of God. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Well, it's been a while since I've started a sermon with an intriguing, cute story or a joke, but today, your long-held silent wishes have been granted. I want to begin today by sharing from the great biblical musical storyteller, Lyle Lovett, and his very large band. Any Lyle Lovett fans out there? Maybe two of you or three? <laughs> well, there's a poem that he wrote. It's a ballad song, and it's titled Church. And he set it to music. And as my gift to you today, I'm not going to sing it. But the poem, I think, is intriguing, and it's really good. Now, I want to just preface this. Uh, I'm going to tell this poem. And then I'm going to tell a story that uh, a, a man, a preacher named Fred Craddock uh, first told, and I heard it, and I'm going to share that. And after that, I'm going to read the scripture, and then I'm going to get the stuff that I wrote, okay, after that. So you just have to, uh, I hope that you find this kind of delightful. It's a, it's a wonderful song. I went to church last Sunday so I could sing and pray, but something quite unusual happened on that day. 
Now, church, it started right on time, just like it does without a doubt, and everything was all just fine, except when it came time to let us out. You know, the preacher, he kept preaching. He told us, I have one more thing to say. Children, before you think of leaving, you better think about the judgment day. Now, everyone got nervous because everyone was hungry too. And everyone was wondering what was the next thing he would do. And the preacher, he kept preaching. He said, now I'll remind you if I may, you all better pay attention or I might decide to preach all day. Now, everyone was getting so hungry that the old ones started feeling ill and the weak ones started passing out and the young ones, they couldn't sit still. And the preacher's voice rose higher. So I snuck up on the balcony and I crept into the choir and begged them, brothers, sisters, help me, please. I said, when I give you a signal, when I raise up my hand, won't you please join with me together and praise the Lord, I have a plan. Well, the preacher, he kept preaching, long is the struggle, hard is the fight. But I prayed, Father, please forgive me And then I stood up and with all my might, I sang to the Lord, let the praises be. It's time for dinner. Now let's go eat. We've got some beans and some good cornbread. And I listened to what the preacher said, but now it's to the Lord, let praises be. It's time for dinner. Now let's go eat. So I did give a signal. I did raise up my hands and then join with me the choir, every woman, child, and man. And they sang to the Lord, let praises be. It's time for dinner now, let's go eat. We've got some beans and some good cornbread. I've listened to what the preacher said. Now it's to the Lord, let praises be. It's time for dinner, now let's go eat. Well, the preacher, he stopped preaching. And a hush the church did fill. And then a great white dove from up above landed on the windowsill. And the dove flew down right beside him. And a fork appeared right in his hand. And with everybody watching, the preacher ate that bird right there and then. (laughs) And now everyone got nervous. And the preacher, he did start to glow. And as we watched on in disbelief, these were the words he spoke. He said, mama's in the kitchen and she's been there all day. I know she's cooking something good. So let's bow our heads and pray. And he sang to the Lord, let praises be. It's time for dinner. Now let's go eat. We've got some beans and some good cornbread. Now listen to what the preacher said. He said to the Lord, let praises be. It's time for dinner. Now let's go eat. And the moral of this story, children, it is plain but true. God knows if a preacher preaches long enough, even he'll get hungry too. And he'll sing to the Lord, let praises be. It's time for dinner. Now let's go eat. We've got some beans and some good cornbread. Now listen to what the preacher said. And so it goes. Thank you, Lyle Lovett. And thank you, Pastor Ed, for not singing that. And maybe next time, Pastor Ed, leave leave out like the middle six stanzas. That was a long poem. Well, some of you might question why I'd tell a long poem using up precious sermon time for this gospel made up story about a preacher in a congregation and something cooking in the kitchen. Well, there was a hint in today's passage that we read. And now it's time for my Fred Craddock story. He says in his sermon called Table Talk, which is on today's passage. And I want you to to take his, his question seriously. I want you to think for a second. If I were to ask you to sketch in your mind a picture that would be properly entitled The Church, what would you draw? Picture it for a second. What would you draw? Would it be a beautiful little building with a spire, a sanctuary with pews of worshipers, maybe a small group in a circle studying the Bible, maybe an altar and a pulpit? Craddock says when Luke portrays the church in the gospel, whatever else is included, he always places in the center a dining table. More than any other gospel writer, Luke describes Jesus at table. Read through his gospel and you probably will be as surprised as I was, Craddock says, to discover how many of the great lessons Jesus gave were given while he was at the table. 
Craddock goes on to say, why is it so vital to Luke to picture the church sitting around a table? Because for him, sharing the food is basic to the definition of church. There is nothing more spiritual anyone can do for one another than to share food. And he goes on to tell an old story. So now I'm telling you about Craddock, who's telling another story. (laughs) He said, in a certain village, there was a rabbi whose absence on the eve of the Day of Atonement was explained by the congregation in this way. Our rabbi has ascended to heaven to make intercession with his people. Now, we don't know much about rabbis or days of atonement. I think what he's trying to say is it'd be like on Easter Sunday if I wasn't here and a stranger who was here on Easter Sunday asked, why isn't Pastor Ed here? And the people would say, well, he's gone up to heaven to intercede, to pray with the people. And the unbeliever in the pulpit would be like, yeah, right would be kind of incredulous. No one ascends to heaven. That's foolish. But the next year, the same explanation occurred. And from this one came the same refusal to believe. That's foolish. No one goes up to heaven to pray. And the third year, this unbeliever determined to find the truth. So he hid near the rabbi's cottage and he waited and he watched. And early one morning, the rabbi got up and gathered what food he had into a sack And the rabbi went out through the woods and he traveled some distance through the forest, pausing at one time to chop down a little tree and to cut it into fuel, to tie it in a bundle and put it on his back. And he continued his way through the forest until he came to a clearing where a very humble cottage housed a widow and her children. The rabbi gave the food and fuel to this poor family. And this was on the day of atonement. The next Sabbath, the congregation explained the absence of the rabbi by saying, the rabbi has ascended to heaven. But the former unbeliever rose and announced, no, the rabbi has gone even higher than heaven in doing that. You cannot go higher, Craddock says, than sharing food. Wherever, and listen to this, Wherever some eat and some do not eat, you do not have church. That's the end of Craddock's story. Wherever some eat and some do not eat, you do not have church. So it says in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Some of them sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts and they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. In Psalm 23, which we read this morning, we spoke it together as our affirmation of faith. What we often remember is, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And we picture the still waters and the green pastures and the walking through the valley of the shadow of death. But more towards the end, the psalmist says, thou prepares a table for me, in the presence of mine enemies. Now to me, unfortunately, that image seems a little bit individualized. I've always kind of had to resist the temptation to picture it like Jesus, like like the Lord sets me down in an easy chair with a TV tray just for me. That's what it kind of sounds like. God prepares a table for me, but I think it's more of an us. It's not just for one. I don't know that the tables God sets are ever just for one. Now, this church, Long Memorial, if you've ever come to one of our meals, I think you would say that we do table fellowship pretty well. Remember just a couple of years ago, though, during the coronavirus pandemic? It goes without saying that one of the biggest sources of grief during the coronavirus pandemic was not being able to eat together. 
Think about that. We had to stay separate from one another. We couldn't look one another in the eye. We didn't get to say, pass the mashed potatoes. We didn't get to spill spaghetti sauce on the tablecloth. <laughs> we didn't get to tell our sister with a quiet smile that she's got a little lettuce in her teeth right there. Praise God that that inferno of viral spread has been tamped down and we can again gather in relative safely. Praise God that we can sit together in the Harris Hall, our fellowship hall, across from one another, surrounded by the din of laughter and the clinking of plates and glasses, that we can get two pieces of chocolate cake and get teased for it. Praise God. This church does table fellowship pretty well. Each morning during the week, not on Sunday, but Monday through Friday, each morning, I see preschoolers sitting around their little tables, being led in thanksgiving by their teachers saying or singing grace, eating their little Cheerios and goldfish crackers. And if one of those kids didn't think to bring goldfish crackers or Cheerios or any little snack, we say, you wait outside. No, no, we don't say that. There's plenty to go around in that table fellowship. There's always enough to share. That's church. That's us. Now, that's not to say that we've achieved paradise. We might be catching glimpses, but God has more to do. It struck me this past during our Lenten lunches, which were magnificent, that as we gathered together for those lunches each Wednesday, there were folks at a different gathering across the parking lot at the Christian Help Center, the soup kitchen, having their meal over there. And I wonder... When, perhaps, the church fellowship might combine, when we might learn to sit across tables from one another. That's really what started happening at Pentecost in today's scripture. 3,000 were added to their number when Peter preached his first sermon. I think the disciples, now apostles, were going to need a bigger table. 3,000. And if we read it closely, we see that everyone was amazed at the signs and wonders that were being performed. And the Lord added to their number those who were being saved, which means, unfortunately for the ushers, that they had to keep finding more chairs. Where did the food come from, you pragmatists might wonder? Anyone who's prepared a meal for others knows it has to come from somewhere. The great fear, I think, of everyone who's ever hosted a meal, whether it's on Thanksgiving Day or a birthday party or a bereavement gathering or a fellowship fundraiser, is that you don't have enough, that you run out of food. All of this, this expanding table, is predicated, it's dependent on the Spirit of God. God's generosity made manifest in the faithful stewardship response of the believers. It says in Acts chapter 2, and I read it a couple of times now, they were together and they shared everything in common. Maybe it was kind of like in those early days, like the stone soup store, you know, where the village is hungry and starving and they don't think they have enough and these out-of-towners come and they're really hungry and they say they have a clever idea and they say, well, uh, <clears throat> we've got everything we need for stone soup, but I tell you, we just don't have a pot Someone says, well, I don't have much, but I got a pot. And they bring the pot. And it goes on and on. And they put a stone in the pot, but then they also put water in the pot and a carrot that someone has and someone else has an onion, someone else has some celery and on and on until there's a great feast with that stone soup. In the end, the villagers discover that God has provided more than enough if we share with glad and thankful hearts, Luke says in the book of Acts, they continued meeting together and breaking bread in their homes and attending to the teaching of the apostles. Attending to the teaching of the apostles. That's the teaching of the apostles. That faith in Jesus and encounter with the risen Lord being filled with the Holy Spirit results in the believers sharing what they had. Some of them even sold property and gave it to those who were in need voluntarily, not coerced by some government as a method of taxation, but because they had love for their brother and sister. And being made one in Christ meant that I am in some respect my brother's keeper. Some of the believers had needs, others had resources, and that's what it looked like. That's how it all began. And this church has done a good bit of that. The ground that we even sit and stand on here was given almost 200 years ago so that we could worship now. 
Someone, maybe lots of people cooking chicken pies long, long ago, shared what they had so that a hundred years later, the people of God could be inspired and comforted by the colors and symbols within the stained glass all around us. But we're not done yet. And our church continues to march on. Some of your offerings and tithes shared freely provide space and food for others to eat and be blessed. Last week through... uh, kind of cooperation with the JCs, the church made possible almost miraculous healing when you think about it, where strangers could come together in a room downstairs and donate blood, what the Red Cross calls the gift of life. This past year, we've been working diligently, and now that work is greatly picking up the pace to prepare to welcome some 35 kids and their families who haven't been here before and help them unlock pathways to their future by helping little kindergartners and first graders learn to read and showing them that they are loved. And each day during that camp, we're going to gather around a table with them and you're all welcome to come to the meals. And each week we'll invite their whole family to eat together with us one evening. And that sounds kind of like church to me. And when we do, we'll say a blessing, We'll pray, we'll listen, and we'll laugh. We'll tell each other. We've got, you know, you've got a little salad dressing right here on your chin. Or a piece of spinach in your teeth. We'll hear big dreams and probably listen to some deep sorrows too. Someone might spill their iced tea on the person sitting next to them. And that person, inspired by Christ, will say something like, that's okay. It's nothing, really. I forgive you. Don't think about it again. It happens already. It happened at Lenten lunches. It happens at bereavement receptions, at breakfasts, and even some cancer-free celebrations. It happens at youth dinners and at church fundraisers. And it happens not just when we're all together. So I hope in kind of closing that maybe some of us will be inspired today. In fact, I wonder if I could offer a challenge to me as well as you that maybe we can have some people over and break bread in our homes. I lament saying, and I feel somewhat guilty about this, that we haven't had in the parsonage many meals since the pandemic started. I wonder if we who are listening, me included, were to invite into our homes someone that we'd never had over before, or even a couple of people, and break bread together with glad and sincere hearts, giving thanks to God, remembering what it was like when it all began. So all this talk about food, I kind of wish it was going to happen this afternoon. That up wafting from the basement of the church, we could start to smell the beans and the cornbread. But today, nothing has been planned. Of course, the disciples on that Pentecost day long ago, they gathered together without anything planned either. And suddenly the sound of a mighty rushing wind was heard and the Holy Spirit filled all who were gathered. So we ask, come Holy Spirit, fill us again like you did when it all began. Come Holy Spirit, prepare a table for us. May we be reassured by your presence with us that even if we are surrounded by enemies on every side, we can eat in peace with our brothers and sisters knowing that you are with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. And please, God, for the sake of the congregation, keep me from preaching too long. And then we'll sing to the Lord and let the praises be, for it's time for dinner. Now let's go eat. We could make some beans and some good cornbread. We, should share, we could share it together because that's what Jesus said. And the moral of this story, children, it is plain but true using the words of Lyle. God knows if a preacher preaches long enough, even he'll get hungry too. I'm hungry for the spirit to move. And I wonder, are you? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In response to the reading of and preaching of God's word today, we sing a hymn, the King of Love, one of an Easter hymn. It's on page 138. And I invite you all to stand as you're able. We will sing... Thanks for giving me a little pause there. We will sing verses 1, 5, and 6. 1, 5, and 6.
we come to our time of prayer, several people asked uh, for prayers today, uh, this morning, and so I want to share those. These are names not included in your bulletin, but I do direct your attention to the back of the bulletin and encourage you, perhaps each one of these names is going through something, and like we all do, we stand in the need of prayer. I was asked to pray for the family of David Cash, for Tamika Lewis and her sister, Joanna Harris, for David Henderson, uh, whose wife is a secretary at Stories Creek and is now battling cancer. We also want to remember uh, Jean Kuykendall, who has uh, fallen Ill, Ill to pneumonia and is up here at Person Hospital. Uh, we pray, too, for all of the names who, who are listed there. Are there others that we would raise up today? Yes. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for watching over us, for leading us through the valleys and being with us in exaltation on the mountaintops. God, we thank you that you have prepared a place for us, that no matter what the circumstances of our life might be, that we can dwell secure in your love, that you have provided abundantly for us. God, give us the courage and the grace to share that which you have first uh, given to us. Help us to remember that we are together at table with all of our, our brothers and sisters in you. Unite us as your church throughout the world. We might have the names of different denominations, God, but we, we serve and follow and worship you, our one Lord, in one faith, celebrating one baptism. God, we pray for those who are lonely, who are ailing, who are undergoing treatments, who have received diagnoses and prognoses that are not encouraging. God, we pray that your healing power would be at work in, around, and through them. God, let us be vessels of your love and mercy and grace, working together to create a more just world. And hear us, God, now as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. As a forgiven and reconciled people, we have the opportunity to share a portion of that which God has first given to us. I invite the ushers to come down at this time. <clears throat>
this bounteous God through all our life be near us with ever joyful hearts and blessed peace to cheer us and keep us still in grace and guide us when we're perplexed and free us, O God, from all ills in this world and the next. We give you thanks for what you have first given us, O God. Amen. Please remain, remain standing as you are able for the hymn that comes from the faith we sing, the paperback hymnal, number 2175, Together We Serve. <laughs> We have celebrated some of the poets and we remember as we go from this place that love is the strength of our song. Go from this place ready to sit at table with one another, rejoicing always, knowing that God has invited all of us to this great, big, wonderful common table. Go in peace. <laughs>